We just got Dave into the band um, in time for Black Summer um, in 2007. So we've, we've done Black Summer with Dave, but he hadn't played on Destiny for Ascension. And we were pretty keen to maybe do something with Dave uh, in the studio. I think the, the new album's actually a really good step because we've tried a lot of the, the different um, things. I think that was just a goal just to play music that. I really like, or we like. Well, it was definitely a case of harder and more aggressive in this one. For after Destiny for Ascension and that, um, what Tim decided to um, relinquish his drumming duties to go to vocal. The album is good. Uh, it has a very raw cool sound. Has a lot of energy. Now my wife was pregnant. Ellie's wife was pregnant. So we knew that pretty much from June onwards of 2008. Things were going to be getting pretty insane in the band. We wouldn't have as much time to rehearse. We wouldn't have as much time to get together to write songs. I guess the main influences were the main four Christian bands, uh, Modification, Vengeance Rising, and Tourniquet and Deliverance. I think the songs were a bit more emotive this time around as well. So it, it really lends itself to that. Well, just the speed with which we just ripped it out is just... It was pretty intensive. I got given the drumming roll. I don't know if I was surprised, but excited anyway. Having Dave on board for uh, his first album with the band um, sort of made things fresh. I mean, we worked on Beside the River Blood from September 05 until September 06 when it finally came out. And then uh, Destined for Ascension, we started in about February of 2007. Didn't finish until January of 2007, uh, 2008. I actually can't believe we did it. Um, we actually recorded it um, literally in a week um, and a couple of days of extra to do um, vocals and things like that on top. I felt this was an album uh, where you could really um, you know, cut loose, feel the music and, and, and let it happen. So we found ourselves in a unique opportunity just to do something really spontaneous and I remember it was Tim who said it, he said, he said Vaughan I, I reckon we need to do an album with Dave and, and, and I'd been thinking along the same lines myself. So one thing led to another and, and next thing you know we're, we're doing an album with Dave. Probably the best album that we've done so far. We really wanted to try and go for a, a release, uh, like one release every year and uh, we had the, the single um, which was after our first album and then we had Destined, so we really wanted to try and get uh, this day forth out really quickly, as in a consecutive year. And so we had like a few songs there and um, just decided to basically put it down in over about a week. Yeah, I'm, I'm always up for doing band stuff. It's definitely a big step up from uh, the last one, Destined for Ascension, uh, where we spent a lot of time getting the, the, the bits right and uh, trying new ideas and uh, I think we kind of <coughs> paved the right ground doing uh, Destined for Ascension where we got uh, the sounds. But um, normally, yeah, we just had a weekend here, a weekend there, you know, do a night here, a night there, uh, just because of uh, the studio we've been working through, that book studios. And, um, and so it's been a lot more sort of off and on, whereas this time it was just fully in and just rip it out. And, uh, and so that was really good. It was put together a lot quicker than uh, the stuff. We figured out what we wanted, the sounds, and then figured out how we wanted the guitar parts to be, the arrangements and stuff like that. And then so with this day forth, we just kind of went down the same path and said, we went out a bit harder, so there was a lot more energy. And that was it. Just put it all together.
and do it as quickly as possible. Tim will provide some lyrics and Elias or myself or both of us will sit down and write some riffs. Another way it happens is that I'll just write some riffs on my own and put some lyrics to them. Or the final way that we come up with songs is I will, Elias and I will sit down together and write some riffs in conjunction with each other and put them to even my lyrics or Tim's. We're demoing the songs, which will eventually become the guide tracks. The demo process it normally starts off very simply with my keyboard. So I've got my old keyboard here, and I get down a basic tempo track. Uh, at the moment we're going at 180 beats per minute, just on a rock beat. I'll record a, a guide track, basically a, a tempo track um, at 180 beats per minute or 160, just a straight rock beat from the keyboard. And as you can see here on Audacity, I don't know if the camera picks it up, it's recording that. Just through my little setup here that I've got out in the back room. And then we'll record some guitar riffs over that. We normally use Audacity, which is a free software, which is really helped us um, in the Great Forsaken Ministry. Basically Elias, who wrote the music for this song, will be, will be playing it into the um, computer, and that will give us our demo that we'll, I'll probably arrange later, cut and paste a little bit to arrange it, put some guide vocals over it. But that demo that has just a basic drum track and a, a rhythm guitar track I'll put vocals on it. Even if I'm not going to sing the song, I'll still be the one to put vocals on it. So I'll have some rough idea of how I want the lyric to go, uh, whether it's Tim's lyrics, whether it's my lyrics, whether it's Matt's lyrics. Then Dave will get that, and he'll practice his drums to it, and uh, that will become his guide track. And I'm completely fine with the other guys, if they're singing a part, coming up with something different taking the lead out of the keyboard and putting it into the Behringer V amp. And there you hear Elias going through exactly the same input. And I'll go back here. And say to Elias, just play that first when you're comfortable. So then I gave a copy of the demos or guide tracks as they were then to teach the guys and they'll each learn their parts. Everything was done in demo form um, just with like rough um, basically 4-4 four -four drumming. The verse of Death Undone written by Matt Skipworth, Elias Salmella and myself kind of. No, I don't think I'll take the credit on yes, this you're, one. You're helping <laughs> arrange it. I'm helping, but I think the credits will just be Skipworth Salmella for this one. But uh, that's how we do it, pretty much a loop. That'll definitely be a first. So, um, I think I just lost the writing credit. And then they will become the riffs that Dave plays to in the studio. So Dave's already been practicing to the very guides that he's going to record to it. It helps the process because it means that when he goes into the studio, what he hears through his headphones is exactly what he's already been practicing to. And then I'll just practice at home and um, come up with as much like, ideas as I could. Virtually just every day you're just constantly changing things. Get the demo, um, and it's in a very raw format, but it's good enough for me to um, practice to it, and I'll probably play it a hundred times over, and just try different things until I um, get a solo that I think sounds good. Elias will take home those same guide tracks and he'll work out his solos. Now he does 90% of the solos on Great Forsaken albums. Then I um, play it and if um, other people in the band like it then, then we go with it. So there you have it people. That is the demo process. And so here's where it's happening. This is where we are rehearsing uh, this day forth. Rehearsing for an album can be a tricky process. You're trying to learn the new album. You're trying to get all your parts right. 
Yeah, basically, we put together eight songs. We all really uh, dig in and try and get a bit more out of ourselves. And the vibe for um, junior practice is it's a lot more focused, it's a lot more dedicated. So, exciting times. We're really um, always excited about recording an album, but this one is especially special because it's come together so spontaneously. And we've got Dave Kilgallen on drums. Now, what happens in Grave Forsaken, as probably happens in a lot of bands, we all live in very different parts of Perth. So it's actually quite hard for the five of us in the lead up to this recording to all get together. So a lot of the stuff uh, we didn't have time to even uh, learn all of it before we went into the studio. So that's why in a lot of the footage you see of Grave Forsaken rehearsing, we're not all there. It's not that we're having some big argument and we don't get along. It's just with people's busy lives, we're all, we're all, um, you know, got our own commitments outside of the band. Uh, it just can be really tricky. Because Vaughn was moving house and. Um, and really my place, you know, it was pretty much just me living there. So um, I had, I've got my, my music room with all my like, band posters and amps and everything. And, um, and it was really just a good place for us to, uh, to have a bit of a temporary, temporary session in. So rehearsal will generally be going through those songs, getting the feel of them, getting familiar with the arrangement. So when we go into studio, we know how everything goes. And of course, I'll play it better on the album. We sometimes rehearse at Dave's house up in uh, Quinn's Rocks, which is uh, far north. Here we are at, at Dave's. We're uh, five days out from starting recording this day forth. We've got Matt here. We've got Dave here. I say to the guys, oh, you know, it's, it's kind of up-tempo, it's kind of melodic or, or whatever, and I kind of have to describe it in those words and, and see what the guys will do with it. There's a lot of that decision time uh, in, in the lead-up to the recording and in those final rehearsals. Uh, am I happy that once this goes down, it's going to uh, it's going to be what I want? When you do a song and, okay, it didn't work that time, we're going to do it again, okay, we're going to practice it again and again, um, and just, just to get the determination of, we've got to know this song, we've got to get this song right. Yeah, there is. Yeah, I've got it wrong. Um, do you want to just take it from the start of when it starts on that... On what? Just before that, like that bit, it sort of goes... Um, We'll go through the songs in rehearsal, um, we'll just play them a few times each, get familiar with them, give each player a chance to do, do their thing. So uh, we try not to panic too much in, in the lead up to an album. We know that once we get in there, as long as we've done our homework, and sometimes even if we haven't, there's still that chance to, to, to nail things. This album has eight songs. Uh, we've written it all this year. Um, most of it, actually a couple of songs were written before. Uh, everyone was talking, you know, let's have a break, let's sit back, and then bang, there was an album in front of us, it was like, Oh, what are we going to do with this? I think it's actually really good because um, it gives people, well, everybody in the band, less time to procrastinate about things and 
uh, less time to think about it because you know sometimes people think about things too much and they go, oh, I don't know if this is quite working, but with a with a tighter time frame, it's like okay, we've got to do it. Okay, that loop, that's it. It's done. Move on to the next bit. Uh, so we kind of got to do it now, and it just so happened with the timing that um, that it was a good opportunity to do it now. Uh, with the last album, the production was very tight, very clean, um, which we all loved, of course, but um, I think this one captures a bit more feeling, uh, a bit more warmth. That's the kit that the drums for Destined for Ascension were recorded on. It's a bit harsher, it's, it's a bit more real. There's the keyboard that... Uh, Scott's keyboard parts on Destined for Ascension were recorded on. What I like about this one is coming back to a bit more of the, uh, just a bit more of that live experience kind of feel. There's a real nice vibe at the studio. I feel at peace and at ease every time I go there. Back to room. Make sure you can get in and out. Oh, actually, yeah, well, that's why I've taken that part of the rack off, because there's another part of the rack there, but... I've probably got a slightly unique take on that in that I've known Dan for years, years and years and years. Daniel's got it all there. It's not the tidiest place. Daniel would freely admit that, but you know everything's in its place. Everything works. And so we've got a, a special relationship. Um, we've sort of been in bands together. We've recorded together. We've played together live. We've done all sorts of stuff. Um, so I guess I'm kind of used to his intensity and his humour and all that kind of stuff. A lot of fun. <laughs> it's basically just may mayhem. Just go nuts, have a bit of fun. And Daniel doesn't know this yet, but he may have suspected it. He will be contributing a solo or two to the new album as well. <laughs> That's all part of his fee. Daniel's studio is uh, it's a very cool place. Presen presence of uh, good friends. And... Uh, yeah, Daniel's an awesome guy as well. Uh, yeah, just a good atmosphere. Daniel's rolling desk, he's the man who knows everything. <laughs> just basically a lot of goofing around and um, good fun had and also a serious note to it as well that we had a job to do but um, just a lot of fun being able to um, basically do the, the sort of hobby and things we enjoy. We will be using the Uber Meta pedal. Uber Metal which is there. Very unassuming as well, you kind of, you go in and you think, man, you know, there's, there's all this great work coming out of this place. And all will be recorded here on Cubase, I'm guessing. That's Daniel's current software of choice. Uh, Cubase 4, because eh, it's the only thing that really gives me the editing power that I want. And um, Cubase 4 plus stack plugins. So this is what we're recording through. We're not recording through the crates we use on stage. At times it's just so straight down the line organised and just perfectly structured, done. Other times it's a little bit more ad hoc. TV for when I'm watching footy. Fine. Next one. Wasting power. Death Undone. It's just a place where when I go to the studio, I can, I can shut out everything else in the world and just focus on, on what we're trying to accomplish musically. We had this last time as well. Really? Like, just, just get an exact tempo of my guides. Yep. Because I do my guides to a, um, a keyboard click. Uh -huh. So even though it says 170 or 160, it's actually a bit out. Uh, Dave rocks completely, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Dave is definitely much more coordinated than I am, which brings out a, a, a world of possibilities that uh, you know would have been impossible with with me still drumming. I 
reckon Dave's the um, only true muso in the band. That's how good he is with these drums. <laughs> His ability to just throw in new elements to the sound, uh, you know, without skipping a beat, he'll just try something. He's just added a whole new level to the band. Just an intensity, uh, just the speed, the, the aggression, I guess, the crazy drumming. His, just his timing, his, his sense of the music and sense of ideas of where songs can go is impressive. <laughs> Ever since I like first started like picking up the drums and all that, I think like um, Dave Lombardo from Slayer, he was a really big influence. No surprises musically. No surprises musically. I just like the fact that um, he wasn't like the most. Um, Good like drummer at double kick drumming and things like that, but his um, big fills and and whatnot they were like really like brilliant and I think they really stood out and just made like a, a album jump out at you and um, I think that's what I was hoping to achieve that just basically really make um, big fills like um, make it real thunderous and um, basically just filling filling the gaps that everything jumps out and keeps moving and it's in your face. Accuracy. Dave is just fantastic with those drums, and uh, I, th I think it's been a great move to uh, to have him on the skins. This was the first recording we'd ever done with Dave. Uh, he'd only joined the band about six months prior, and we were really keen to get a really old school thrash kind of vibe going and. We just completely trusted Dave with his tracks just to do do his thing and uh, he, he did amazingly well. One of the most, not technical, but one of the most technical songs I've ever seen. The music to No News Ain't Good News, I really wanted to go for a, 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 I guess a real 80s thrash vibe, so if you pick that up it's deliberate. I had in mind bands like Anthrax and Megadeth, who I'm a big fan of. I really wanted Grave Forsaken to write something like that. We've never quite managed that kind of level of thrash intensity, so that's what that song was about musically. <laughs> Pretty much I just put the mics on the drums and let him go for it. He's taken us like three levels up, you know, stuff that level, you know, he's taken us three levels up.
Dad's a real solid bass. Dave, Dave has got a fantastic sense of tempo. Uh, when you're playing with him, it is like playing to a drum machine. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, this sounds great. I'll use it more than anything else. He's just a prodigious talent. Uh, he'll hate me for saying that, but I mean, Dave, I'm, I truly mean it. I know, it was so quick. Mm. I mean, what, we, we scheduled two days and... <laughs> well, at least that gives us, like, a chance to fix anything up anyway. So we, um, we've done the drums. It's uh, quarter to nine on Saturday night on, on the 12th. We're all done. And uh, we're going to come back tomorrow and check they're all right and start setting up for the rhythm guitars. Uh, but this album is actually pretty raw. Um, uh, on the last album we used uh, stuff like BFD for the drum tracks and uh, we midi them, whereas this one it's all mic'd up and uh, just put the mics on, press record and go and all the guitars were mic'd up. Everything was mic'd up in this one, so um, it is the actual sound. I'll break for a second. Yeah, we're looking forward to putting down some guitars and um, yeah, it's sounding pretty good so far. The songs have come up well. and. I'm very glad I don't have to listen to those guide tracks anymore because <laughs> they've been driving me yeah, crazy. They don't. Yeah, so I've been listening to them for the last uh, three months or so. So um, yeah, I thought uh, I thought it went really well. The first time you work with Daniel, it can be quite a shock because he is so blunt. It's just his nature. Daniel is. <laughs> is Daniel hot? Is Daniel harsh in the studio? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, that's an uh, understatement. <laughs> yeah. he, he's not one to mince words. Not at all, he is so gentle, so patient. He is kind of patient sometimes. Oh, come on! I don't go anywhere near as hard with you boys as I want to. Actually, I, I really like uh, working with Daniel. I think, I think I just find his brutal honesty refreshing. When Daniel speaks, you listen. <laughs> no, he, he's a good guy, but he, he tells you how it is, and, and then some. Daniel sucks. When, when he's got that... Uh, yeah, mouth pointed in my direction. Oh, I know exactly what he means. He can be fun, though. He can be pretty, um... Do it. I think I want to mention a little bass or Another minute and a half! Definitely uh, a bit of a challenge at times because he knows when it's going to be right and he's not happy until it is. Do it again, do it again, and you do it again until you get it right. When Daniel tells you that you got something wrong, he, he means it. What are you trying to do, Elias? Hey. What are you trying to do? Not suck. No, no, I think it takes pretty easy, man. Yeah, apart from computer issues. Yeah, all good. And, uh, you know when I say you suck, I mean really, you suck. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that that was gonna be quite tough, but uh, I don't really see it that way. Um, I don't take it to heart. Um, I think it's just being honest. But through that bluntness comes a great respect, and. Anyone in Great Forsaken would tell you that Dad worked with Daniel any day of the year. By the end of it, you just uh, get, get some uh, bit of stuff done, get a better album out of it. There was one incident where he decided he'd turn the lights out on Dave while he was playing, but Dave didn't miss a beat, and he kept playing, and I'm pretty sure that that take was the final. Even while recording drums, got people flicking off the lights while I'm in the studio booth. <laughs>
something he's pretty good at, you know, with that. Let me see that. I can't even say it. No, it's just a gap. Yeah. He is blunt, but he's, he's a great producer, he knows his stuff, and he's a really good friend. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm that hard, I just want it to be good, that's all, and I think I see the, uh, the potential of what it could sound like, and so just keep doing it till you get it right. So just do it again, but just do it better this time. We still thought we'd come back on Sunday and uh, just have a listen and see if Dave needed to re-record anything before he packed away his kit, but there ended up being no real problems at all. It was just a fantastic vibe. I've, yeah, pretty happy. Yep. It always been a little bit better, but nah, God's looked after us, so we're all happy. Like, uh, you, you've got to get the splat symbol. Splat, 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 splat. splat symbol. Dude, you have to frame that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not going in the bin, that baby. So now you can see the empty room. Yeah. And the, yeah, the remains of Dave's drums as they go out. Job well done to Dave. And uh, setting up and I'll lay down some some rhythms today. When we started this for Ascension, uh, I think I set out to achieve kind of a tonic sort of tense sort of tone where uh, kind of really sharp, uh, focused sort of uh, guitar tone. Um, and uh, that's what we did on the first one, so actually the second one, my first one. Um, so we just pretty much did the same thing again, um, but again I think we've got a, a better time. Now the funny thing about this was, uh, Elias wasn't there that day, he wasn't coming in until the Monday, so we're there on the Sunday and I managed to play uh, Wasting Power, I think it was, completely wrong. <laughs> I played it a step down and I didn't even pick it up because, well, there's no real excuse, I played it wrong. <coughs> so the Grave Forsaken Machine, the Grave Forsaken Machine continues, and there's my van ready to go as well. Now essentially, the next few days, uh, Monday through to Thursday, were dedicated purely to guitar and bass. Once once it gets comfortable and, and really starts to relax, then the, the real quality um, of, of Vaughan's musicianship shines out. Uh, it's just getting in that zone and then letting it happen. And He's been one of my closest mates for years now and I absolutely love working with him. Uh, he's always encouraged me, he's brought out the best in me and my personality as well as my drumming. I reckon what's interesting is the songs have a more immediate vibe to them and we're recording it more immediately. So they kind of, yeah. the whole thing's got a more urgent feel to it. Yeah. Whereas perhaps on the first album, we were a bit tentative because it was our first studio recording. So we we're focused on getting things right. Whereas here, if the odd squeak or squeal comes in, it actually adds to the character of the song and we're willing to go with that. Mm. Um, and I think, I think we're just going to, it's going to be a brutal album. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. love working with him and hope it continues for a long, long time. No, very cool. It was a good sound. Um, I like just the techniques and how, how he actually set it up. It was different to the other albums. Um, so yeah, I think it's um, I think it just gives it a very different feel, which is really good. And I think that's what we need at this point in time. We've had sort of two albums and you know, some other bits and pieces that have kind of used a similar technique. So um, I think going fully, fully mic'd up, fully live, authentic kit. Just 
The, the, the playing was a lot better as well. Uh, the improvements for both Warren and Ellis were uh, significant over the uh, Destin album. So uh, all up, very, very good. So I just think the fact that we're actually recording straight through, doing a, you know, a week record, um, is also going to be different. I think that's going to make a different sound, a uh, different vibe for the album. Because everything else, you know, has been you know, Friday night here, and then the next weekend it'll be, you know, a couple of hours on Saturday, and so all of our recording has actually been really disjointed up to this point. So yeah, again, yeah, Matt's an absolute gem. He's like unreal live. He's a, he's a party monster, that guy. He's <laughs> getting up on all the stage equipment and going nuts, and um, he's a lot of fun to work with as well. He has just, just got the ability to listen to a song, work out what it is, and play something that works. We wanted to go for a heavier sound, uh, much more of a driving sound, and um, a lot of the other albums, I've had a lot of offbeats and things like that, like in Northwind, where we went for a more of a percussive sound. There's a kind of beeping sound in there, it's just kind of grating on my nerves. I'm gonna get rid of that. Uh, I think it might be Vaughn's track. We did three bass tracks, we did, Elias has done I think, <laughs> three and a half guitars and I've done six. Celebrity 3, I love, I love the way that that song has turned out. <laughs> This one was, I think, finally uh, approaching the, the, the vision that I had uh, for that theme, the, the celebrity judge songs um, are about the, uh, the final judgment of mankind and how that unfolds in a theoretical uh, story, if you like. Uh, just play a few riffs for a celebrity. Oh, so Matt is really, he, he's fantastic to work with because you know you can just leave it up to him to come up with something that fits. I never have to write bass lines. And here is Matt laying down bass to our Doom song on this album. There's always been a Doom element to our sound. I used uh, a five-string carbon bass, uh, beautiful uh, through-neck, uh, active-passive, really nice, really nice bass. Love this bit. I guess I would say that it's important that Matt has his space so that he can get in his own zone. Um, I've got one more song to do on bass. This is why I'm sitting here on the drums, electric drums. Um, yeah, just influenza, and then my bass is done. No, it was insane. Um, I hardly felt like we even knew um, a number of the songs, and and some of them just while the guys were playing and recording, I was sitting there trying to figure out exactly 
What we were doing, yeah, it was insane. It's pull that face again. In one set, rather than having to do 300 drop Hey Matt, pull that face again. Which one? The one that you did early on. Or is it the... Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one. Get yeah. angry. You made your frustration on that face. Oh, I mean. <laughs> Hey, it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it. Yeah, for this one we wanted it a little bit heavier, a little bit more intense, a lot more kind of downstroking. We DI'd, so we went straight through uh, with a bass pod. Uh, not my one actually, it's Daniel's one. Which is quite different because I, I normally pretty much play sound gear and sound gear and sound gear with PV amps wherever I can. But uh, but actually recording, um, in fact this one and the last one we've used the carbon basses. <laughs> What was it like working with Elias in the studio? <laughs> he's a champion, he's awesome. Oh, it's brilliant working with Elias, he's a top bloke, um, great fun, I love working with him, he's a um, lot, lot of fun, just basically like um, everything that he actually brings to it sort of thing, you can you can have a laugh. And... It takes a, a few takes sometimes showing the nail something. He's also a bit of a perfectionist with the solos, so he'll have many goes at them before he's happy. So... <laughs> He's always right. His his the the next attempt's always better. I've never once had a time with Elias where he's ripped a solo and I've said keep it and he said nah I can do better and he hasn't done better. Doesn't Elias have a solo in there? to that but Elliot Solo has been deleted. <laughs> it's been a real bonus to have Daniel pitching in. Well I just kind of I hear ideas when someone plays guitars I hear what, we, what else we could do rather than just what's having what's happening straight away. <laughs> What else could we do? How could we have? Because obviously you have two guitars in the band, so there's no point in having both guys playing the same parts all the time. So if you can add something else, fantastic. It just... This is what happens when I write parts that are too hard for me to play. The man, the man does it. That's the man. James is a dear friend of mine from the way back, and. Also, a keen photographer. A lot of fun. We had um, James Mosher Clark doing photos, brilliant photos as usual. Yeah, when we were looking for somebody to come and um, do photography for us, I thought, well, he would be dead keen. Uh, he's a he's a top bloke. He's great fun to work with. His point. Aside from a dedicated friend and also a fan of the band, he's been uh, you know just a a faithful companion for us, all our gigs and stuff, uh, documented James's been uh, just about every one. We got James Mosher Clark in and we decided to go to Kudal which was currently, uh, it was an old uh, freight yard and it was being wrecked. So we thought it'd be good to get some photos in amongst the debris. His shots are great, he's always giving new equipment, trying it out, trying new things. Uh, well the location was, there was a lot of stuff around it, quite a few dangerous pieces of uh, building material scattered around the place and we had to get around that and we had to, you know, climb up on the thing and just make sure we didn't fall down any crevices anywhere. It was basically just a um, old school, like, underground sort of, like, um, construction site. We ended up in the back lots of uh, Hudal, which is an industrial area. Um, there's always a lot of heavy machinery about and uh, 
I, I drive through this place on my, uh, in, the, in the course of my work, and I've often gone past and seen uh, freight trains and stuff around the area, and they have lots of uh, derelict buildings lying around. Uh, we started talking about photo shoot locations, and then I remembered that they were uh, actually demolishing this massive uh, warehouse. And I thought, that would look cool. Just standing there amongst the doors of all this stuff and just twisted metal everywhere. Um, we talked about the album cover design as well and the artwork for that. Uh, it's this giant robot wasting everything we thought, man, this is going to fit. It's going to be like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's moved to a, a natural choice. Um, and I think it just lends a bit of that real sort of, uh, you know, uh, thrash metal sort of feel to it. Uh, it's not something you have to read into it or interpret, it's kind of in your face, it's like, yeah, you know, really very much it. Yeah, just, just rip it up, and I think all that wreckage and destruction kind of uh, reflects a bit of the. Uh, the power of the album as well. Um, just some of that sort of musical brutality with what you were to Well, we wanted to look uh, about all the devastation and destruction, so we wanted to have the background and the photo quite messy and showing some of all the demolition and derelict type buildings and that kind of thing. So, yeah, we wanted to show something about like, the, the end of the world coming on and you know, the age is changing to a, a new uh, and everything's being destroyed. So we got out to the location and we just found it was quite a rainy day, which I think helps the photo shoot because there's a bit of a, a bit of a sense of gloom there and, and we're not a gloomy band. However, this album deals with some fairly serious subject matter. Yeah, it was a pretty dark day as well, but I had two flashes with me on that day, so that was enough to sort of give us enough light for the show. We were pretty excited, it was kind of some really nice overcast conditions, um, capture some nice scenes of destruction. Also on the day it was, uh, the weather wasn't all that good, so it's always a bit of a worry with the camera gear, which is not exactly waterproof to so, uh, just keep things dry and all that kind of thing. But the overcast kind of turned a little bit nasty, and uh, I think probably the biggest thing I remember was uh, trying to get into one area that had been completely smashed out and uh, it was bucketing with rain and we were sort of running back and forwards and kind of saying, ah, I don't care, let's get soaked, if we get soaked, too bad. So I had a couple of plastic bags with me just in case we sort of shower and things like that. Unfortunately poor James was probably a little bit more concerned about his cameras than you know, us getting, well, us looking like drowned rats. I got the photos because they rain a bit, so it's a lot of fun run away from the rain. The group of guys that were kind of securing the, that particular area as well were, you know, were closing in, you know, five minutes. So we really had to run in and get those shots really quick. Yeah, well, we had to actually get permission from the workers to be able to go into a certain section. We always something new, and we always try something new with each album. The first album, we, we went for the quarry and all the rock background, and then the second album, we stopped out on the salt lake for most of it. And for this third one, yeah, as I said, it's in a demolition site. So, yeah, it's been really challenging, creative. So the photo shoot went really well. It was a good day. We're really happy with what came out. We think it really captures the essence of, of Grand Forsaken. The guys are really great. Um, they do what they're told. Sometimes when you work with people, it's a lot harder to get them to do what you want. The guys in Grand Forsaken sort of have a good idea about what they want for their photos and they're willing to cooperate to get that. Yeah, no, it was just like a really good, fun experience. I think he's been just a major part of the uh, small support crew that, that we've had. He's going to be moving to Japan, which is it's fantastic for him and his wife, who is from Japan. The bad news for Grave Forsaken and, and the Perth Christian metal scene, he'll be a big loss. 
um, gigs won't be the same without the mosher. Filming or taking shots, photo shoots won't be the same without, without the mosher. We're really going to miss him and it's great that we got to do this one last photo shoot with Mosha to represent that time that we had with him. Hopefully it's not the end of our association with him, but for the short term it certainly would appear to be. So, Mosha, we salute you. So Matt's through his bass. We've just done leads and harmonies for No News Ain't Good News. Uh, I'm about to do my really good part for Celebrity Part 3, um, which I think is sounding the best of the trilogy. This is the V3 that we're playing through. And that's actually over here in the sound room, the isolation room. Then uh, I've still got to do some rhythm guitar on uh, Mother of Harlots, and then Ellis will finish his rhythms. And yeah, so if we can be finished our rhythms today, that will be our goal. There we go. So that's mic'd up in here. And that is what we're recording through. In here, so it's cranked. I don't remember coming across a song where I I went, oh, no, you got it totally wrong. Uh, which we'd done before and then worked with it and, and wrote uh, different tunes and stuff. Song Mother of Harlots musically was, was inspired by stuff like Slayer. We wanted a, a fast tempo. Whether it sounds like Slayer, I don't know. You'll have to tell me. But that was that was the reference point, I suppose. Um, Rain and Blood, that kind of intensity. recording my rhythm, I actually like to do them in one take. Hey, one take long. I like to think, where possible, that what I've played, what you hear on the album, when you hear my playing on the album, you're hearing me from start to finish in one take. I bet uh, in, in the old school days, um, they had, they had mix there. Um, a little, if you missed it, you did the whole thing again, eh? Yeah, mate, it was all that all right? My, my first big purchase was a, an Akai uh, MD1212, big 12 channel, uh, massive it was, 12 channels, mixing desk with a 12 track, uh, half inch tape building, it was like, um, yeah, old school. Uh, pretty good actually, it was easier than I thought. Yeah, we've probably only spent about what, half an hour on it. Yeah. Seven minute song, that's not too bad. That's, that's not too bad, I'm adding uh, many of the songs, so mm. I knew the opening with. So yeah. I, I reckon you played it pretty well. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was good for the first day. Mm. And just the way this album's been recorded, we've pretty much got no choice. Yeah. It's got to be done that way. It's done, I'm, I'm relieved. Yeah. It's all over. Now we've just got to do some leads. So the rhythms are done. And yeah, now we've done leads for one song. So it's a uh, what quarter to two on Wednesday. So yeah, we've um, in five days we've done all the rhythm, and uh, now I've just got leads and vocals. So going very nicely, exactly as I'd hoped. I guess there was uh, less time to uh, think about the whole process. Good, eh? Um, I think uh, 90% of it was satisfactory and 10% not sure. How's it sound? Beautiful. Yeah? Alright. Do you like it, Elias? Um, 
was more focused on what I was Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I, I don't play this. But, uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. I appreciate Dan's advice. Um, actually, a lot, a lot of the stuff that he does is a uh, big inspiration as well. Hey, yeah, they say this comment in the right spirit. What Daniel played was more what I had in my head. Yeah. I think just watching him um, play and work the way he does um, has made me a better player as well. Shred, shred some uh, is not that great in real life. He's only great in studio. <laughs> <laughs> What's the master at work? Quite a lot of the stuff that I did do there was uh, improvised on the spot. Still a bit, yeah, still a bit more to go as well. Yeah. What do you reckon sounds better, starting on the drums or starting two bars after? Well, I, first, first I was going to... Uh, let the drums go. Let the drums go and then two bars after. Try it that way again, I reckon. Yeah, yeah the solo work, was definitely, there was a lot more stuff. Uh, solo was than any previous work that we had. I think that presented um, opportunities for diversity, but also we we came into a a bit of um, a bit of old ground started to get yeah, covered, I suppose, because uh, we didn't have a lot of recording time. Dan just hit the record button and said, "Go for it." Pretty good, eh? Yeah. Sometimes you've been there going wrong, 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 come on, get it, you know you can do it, we know you can do it, you've done it before, and we, we wait and wait, and, and eventually it comes, and it's beautiful. We did a few takes and we chose the best one out of them. Still building. Yeah. Good man. Yep. With a little time to um, think about what I do, I think sort of sound a lot more raw and relentless. He works um, very closely with Daniel and follows um, all the advice he gets and, and does a fantastic job. Just that, that ending, we, uh, I mean, we do the. Um... Yeah, it's a dead, dead. Once he gets in the zone, it really starts to flow, and um, some, some really great stuff happens. Yeah, so I want to keep that, that, that true bit. Because you yeah. make a mistake and you set a call. Yeah, so cool. we'll keep it. Right. You, you'll never be able to play that again. Yeah. You'll never get it right like that. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless. So, so if you're a professional man, that sounds alright. He also brings out like the best like in, in me as well. Is like He's a very good encourager. And, um, no, I love, love working with him. So the album will be more or less done mm. on schedule. We've just got one extra day in the studio, but that's no big deal. It's no problem at all, actually. I'm glad there's still more time. Um, but he's also a real professional at what he does. He's always like there practicing. His ideas are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs>
Sounds pretty good, eh? The ideas that I came up with were just kind of um, uh, the sort of stuff that the OS possibly could play, but it would take a while. And um, so we, obviously we had a, a much tighter time schedule on this one. So it was a lot more like, uh, Dan, just play it. If you've got an idea, just play it. All right, I'll play it. See how it goes. If it works, great. If not, delete it. And uh, so that's what we did. He's the uh, other true musician, but he's not actually in the band. But but yeah, he's he's uh, what he does with the songs and with his guitar playing is just magic. Had to uh, play his XA. That's it. Is that right? Yeah, we play it further up though. Yeah, but it's in the same chord. So yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah I'll play it on yeah. top string, yeah. Oh, absolutely stoked. Um, Adam's a true, true champ. We were really happy on this album to get uh, to make a deal with Soundmass. Our first two albums have come out on Rowe Productions, which is distributed by Soundmass. Absolute huge honour to be able to um, have the album released on his label. We just felt that on this one, because we're already being distributed and working very closely with Soundmass, that it was time to take the next step and actually approach Soundmass about signing the band. Yeah, I reckon the little skull of the uh, sound must lay there. I reckon they were look good on our CD. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've basically been there for Distro and all that since day one, um, with all the bands that have been in. So I talked this over with Steve Rowe, and I said to him, look, you know, we're looking, we're thinking of maybe switching over full, full time to sound mass. And, and Steve had no problem at all with that. In the slightest, Steve has been a fantastic support. It's good fun to hang around. Haven't been able to hang out with him too much because he's on the other side of Australia, but um, he's a really good guy. Why is this album not released on Rome Productions? Um, and, the, and the simple answer is that we did it with Steve's blessing. I wanted each member to have their own voice. So that's why we do the multi vocalist approach, and this album was going to be no different. I think having a number of vocalists um, starts a great deal of good. Tim would now take the lead vocal role that I had, as Dave was in on drums, and I would fall into more of a role akin to what Tim would have on previous albums. So I would sing a bit, but not as much, and whereas I would handle 70-80% of the vocals on the first two albums, now Tim would handle that kind of ratio, and being that he's the lead singer and no longer playing drums, it was important that Tim also appeared in every song. The one thing that ensured that from the outset we didn't get chucked in a particular roles. So we got in to record the vocals. Um, we're going to have a lot of gang type vocals on on this particular album. No news. Hey. Very important to the overall sound of the album to give it that, uh, I suppose, that street level thrash vibe that we were looking for on this one. As a band, you know, we weren't sort of uh, categorised into just one genre. Also, I think it added a lot of flavour to uh, the songs when you uh, chuck in a couple of different voices. It really um, just adds another layer to the sound. And I think that was good for us because it allowed us the freedom to explore and discover who we actually were and what we wanted to do.
I've actually done less vocals on this album than I have than I have on the other two. Okay, uh, Death Undone is essentially looking at, I guess, things we go through um, in life and all the kind of emotions and experiences we go through um, and how often a lot of it will try and bring us down, a lot of it sort of tries to beat us into submission and so we, we kind of give up in a lot of ways. Cool. So I've got a couple of, sort of a couple of different words to change just in case, like this or yours and stuff. Right, which one do I want to use? I don't know. Okay, what do you reckon, Al? And Dave? Yeah, uh, do you want the snare snaps shut or the snare will snap? Uh, what? What? And basically, yeah, the song is essentially that death is undone, it's finished, it's over, it's irrelevant, um, primarily because of Christ and what he did. Uh, and yeah, that he's actually our option, our way out of all the nastiness that goes on in life and in this world. With Matt, sometimes you need to give him a bit of extra motivation just to get his absolute best vocal performance out. And I think we achieved that. It's a trick question. Don't answer it. Okay, oh, okay. This, this one's a bit easier. Okay, it's either a now lit fuse or a shortened fuse. I kind of like shortened, but... Okay, shortened it is. Go, go with it. <laughs> so you're going to... <laughs> right. He's gonna be just into it, man. Just do it, just it, man. It was a bit different because I I did a lot less uh, vocally on this one than I have on our previous ones. Uh, pretty much a bit on Affluenza and a bit on Death Undone, which was very cool, awesome song. <laughs> I'm trying to film. I think I really just wanted to go in there and, and give it what I could. Um, I think that's pretty much as simple as that. I'd have to say that the, the Christian faith of the band has always been uh, very clearly displayed in these, um, in the songs that we've written. Um, we've kept that a feature of the band throughout the history. And uh, I see no signs of that slowing down. The real Christianity that we promote in Great Forsaken uh, is not about empty promises. It's, it's about real stuff that you can apply to real life. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can I just say, um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be, or something? Yeah, there your heart will be, you can say that. For where your treasure is, there, your heart will be.
it come to the, the what we thought was going to be the last night of recording, and Tim came in and did his vocals, and, and he put in a great performance. <laughs> Right from the very start, man. Way back at the very, very start. Wasting Power is a very personal song for me. Uh, still is. Disease cripples us. Sickness weakens us. Every day we die while you grow. Because I despise the, the world system of uh, working too hard to get not enough to uh, actually live your life. We don't have a choice in this sickened world. Force fed everything that we know. It surprises me in a day that people talk about affluence and doing well, the kind of materialism that really uh, has peaked in recent times. Only God renews the mind. Only God renews the mind. Only God renews the mind. Only God renews the mind! That it's been so hard for everyday people to get by. Just because I'm not sure I've got that really right. Well, yeah. well let's go and give it a listen. Right. Yes. At the Bat, the bat Cave. <laughs> this reminds me of something, I can't work out what. Quarter to 11, Monday the 28th of April, and we have just one song to do vocals on, and all the tracking's done in two and a half weeks. So you've got to be happy with that. Never satisfied to find happiness. Save your soul, you fill the hole. He'd been working on the songs, and he laid them all down in one hit. Out well, eh? Yeah. Could I just have a listen to the songs that um I didn't hear at the start? Yep. Cheers, man. Can. Well what happened I think was we captured the energy of the moment rather than rethinking it fifteen times and then going, Oh maybe we could have done it better. So um, that didn't happen. We didn't have to do it again, so I think we get a better result in the end. What about this part? There's one part you don't like. I'm 99% happy, man. <laughs> <laughs> what, my honest opinion? Yeah, it's not good, eh? I'm, I wouldn't think anything of it. Yeah, either. Yeah, that's not good, eh? Serious, man. I'm, yeah. I'm totally happy with that. Yeah, that was wicked, that man. That was wicked, man. You've done, done a really good job, eh? You did, you oh. did a really good job, man. Good stuff. Yeah. I think the cover artwork of an album is a very important part, and uh, the whole layout and design, it really gives the album part of its feel, and uh, we've always worked hard in Grave Forsaken to have a really, what we hope is a striking cover, and really good layout. Now, we've always worked with Elias' friend, Ari, and I'm just zooming in here. That's the beside the river blood cover. And then there's the Destined for Ascension cover. Now are we Ari put both of those together. It just adds to the value of money I think and, and these days with the legal downloading I think it's important to have an interesting package. Now what I'm showing you is the layout. Which by the time you have this you'll already have seen. Now this has been done by Mark Kelson who does a lot of the layouts for Sound Mass. We think the layout is definitely the best layout out of all the three Great Forsaken albums so far. Um, Mark Kelson has done a great job. I particularly like the grainy feel that he's given it and I like uh, the newspaper cuttings. That was actually originally an idea by Elias and Mark's managed to apply that exactly as our vision goes. With the cover, I just think it looks fantastic. There's a bit of a theme of destruction on this album and a bit of a theme of, um, I suppose, God's judgment coming down 
and we just felt that the, the robot design laying waste to the city uh, really, really matched with the theme that we're looking for on this album. So all in all, we think it's definitely our best CD sleeve yet. We always like to have full lyrics and some thank yous and just so people can see who, we're, who we are and who played on what and who did what on the album. So for the other two albums, I did the booklets um, myself on Adobe Illustrator. The River Blood cover was based on an image that um, Elias drew and then Ari coloured. But the Destin for Ascension color, cover, that was Ari the whole way. Ari lives in Finland, is an old friend of Elias's, uh, and he has worked extensively with us on the covers of uh, both our albums, our EP and our single. So we are a great debt to Ari. So here you see the uh, original artwork that Elias's friend Charlie Peranen drew for the cover of This Day Forth. So he submitted a black and white image, which you see there. Uh, it was drawn by a good friend of mine called... Uh... Charlie Perrin. So what happened was we took it to Ari and then Ari coloured it. And you can see there the final version of the uh, cover as it will appear. Yeah, we we're having thoughts that we might go with it. We thought it would be a good idea on this album to have, um, have kind of a mascot. So on the cover you see uh, the mascot Mutilator, which is kind of a bit like a manga anime type of robot. The idea also was to have sort of like a band mascot like uh, Iron Maiden uh, Scott Eddie and uh, Megadeth. So what's the what's the skeleton man? What's his what's his name? Uh, Vic. Vic is it? Yeah. Yeah. Vic so. Rattlehead. And a couple of guys in the band are pretty big fans of of anime and manga and that kind of thing. So when Elias's friend Charlie drew that, it um it it seemed to fit quite nicely with the theme. With this one. Uh, with the robot, um, yeah, it's, it's supposed to be a bit, a bit of a mascot or something. I think it looks quite good at that stage when you compare it to the original. And I think the team of Charlie and Ari together on this one have done a really great job. We thought the album was in the can, and that's when uh, we were hit with a massive curveball. Probably the most difficult thing, uh, certainly from my experience, that, that we've encountered in band. Um, just, just went so well. We never really wanted anyone to leave. We never wanted even a lineup change. Never really um, wanted Tim to leave the band, but I didn't really crossed my mind that he needs to go or anything. It was actually like, um, like a bit, a bit sad. We'd always kind of had this dream um, when we first started that you know, it was us for, for against the world, you know. Um, you know, we are great forsaken. Without the hand of God, one of the things that, um, that happened with Matt, there's, there's no way that that would have been um, so easy and painful. And yeah, I mean, I, I still remember a lot of the, some of the early things that we, we did as a group of four, that we, we were a team. It was actually really difficult for me, I suppose, because um, you come into the band sort of thing and, um, and then one member leaves, it's almost like you're taking over someone's spot. And, um, I never intend to do things like that, I don't like that. But what we found after we'd recorded um, Raw Tracks for this day forth, um, Tim's life just got really busy. I found a whole bunch of extra responsibilities coming on me uh, in a very short period, looking quite overwhelmed. And, and he was just finding it really hard to get the practice. And it was a really difficult situation for us because you know, Tim was an original member of the band. A lot of stuff with ongoing uh, ramifications in my personal life and my Christian ministry. So it was, it was very sad to, to see someone leave. Um, I mean, Tim had his reasons and, you know, a, a lot of um, just time as a band member in Great Forsaken is an expectation that uh, everybody is um, dedicated and committed. It is. It's a huge time commitment. 
whether it's practices or gigs or rehearsals at home and all that kind of thing. I found myself um, really struggling to keep band commitments. We say to him, look, we seriously need to talk about this. Um, it's just not it's just not happening at the moment. It was really sad and, and we can well I mean I, I guess I completely understood exactly why that he wasn't really able to. It was time to say, look, there are priorities in my life that I didn't set. Uh, I'm happy to do uh, what God wants me to do. I'm happy to be where he wants me to be. Tim had sort of said, Well look, you know, I've been worried as well because I just haven't been able to find the time I want to commit. I don't want to let you guys down. Yeah, towards the end, he just had a lot of commitments and stuff. It was Saturday afternoon in July 2008. We all agreed that it was probably in the best interest of the band for Tim to step aside. Uh, but certainly not the end of uh, relationships with the guys, uh, all of whom I love very much, and yeah, we'd do anything for them, and still my very best mates. Just all of a sudden, we had our first person leave in Great Forsaken, and it was a really difficult time for the band. Yeah, Tim, Tim's always been a good friend and stuff, and he played a very important role in the band. I've loved every minute of being uh, in Great Forsaken. Uh, it's a time I'm going to cherish. Um, now, it's been, yeah, some of the best times of my life. I mean, it was a lot of fun having him in the band, we had a lot of good laughs. To people who are, you know, uh, sort of thinking about the old days and thinking, oh, uh, you know, the the original lineup of the band is, uh, you know, the way that I like to remember it. I'd, I would say, look at what the band is doing now, because it is moving in great places. made a tough decision a couple of months later because we weren't sure would we release the album with Tim's vocals on it or would I re-record them now that I was going to be the vocalist again and in the end we decided that we'd have to go with the option of re-recording the vocals by just leaving some of Tim's parts on them I'm going to be quite open about the fact that Tim did sing on it and it got changed later. I'm not going to try to hide yeah. what happened. Before that decision was made, I actually spoke to Tim to, to make sure that he was cool with the reasons why uh, they needed to be re-recorded and he was. He was very understanding. You see, Tim is all about ministry. This is going to be a bit complex. We have to get rid of me singing never satisfied and put Tim's never satisfied back in. <laughs> So is that Tim's above there, is it? So Tim's never satisfied is staying. Tim still appears and is credited as a member of Great Forsaken on this album, even though he left before the album was finished. And hopefully now you have a bit of background as to, as to why we went that way. And we'll keep my wanting more, never satisfied, clutching at straw. We'll keep mine yeah. doing a double vocal. Yeah. This gives it a little bit extra. <laughs> So yeah, it's a little bit complicated, we've got to do this the whole way through. Now going back in, was um, it was a fantastic experience because we'd, we'd recorded the album six months before, so to go, have to go back in for another session to re-record these vocals on an album that we thought we'd wrapped, um, it was a real nice experience. <laughs> Affluenza is a song about 
I didn't make up the word affluenza. If you look it up on Wikipedia, I don't actually know who did, but I think it's a great word. And affluenza, to me, means the sickness of wanting more. And I thought this related very closely to Ecclesiastes, where it says, you know, whoever loves wealth never has enough wealth. I thought it's so true about the Western world we live in. <laughs> I've just realised in the last couple of years of my life, God's brought me a real awareness that it's just all very short term. And this sickness we have of desiring more, of never being happy until we've got more and more, I really just wanted to write a song that reflects that feeling. Sometimes I struggle with uh, phrasing. Um, because um, English is my second language. English isn't Elias's first language, so he can sometimes struggle with the words that we've written. Yeah, I've done most of my um, schooling in Finland as well. I think uh, probably the biggest thing is nerves though, like when, when uh, the record button is on, the nerves hit in. <laughs> so it can take him a few takes to get through things, but that's fine. Um, always really happy with the result that comes out from Elias, and it's, it's always quite popular with the people who are listening to the music as well. <laughs> The song uh, Holy Blood is about Jesus' blood shed on the cross. I wanted to give it quite a brutal lyric. The lines like putrid armies of hatred and mowing down like weeds, you know, that's, that's God and um, how ultimately he will come and destroy all the evil. This Day Forth is a song about, um, it's just, it's just a, it's a song about how God has always been there through the ages to, um, to help mankind and to, to show them the way. And this day forth means from this day forth we're going to follow that. So we've just, just finished the vocals and on the move, move, move bit I actually blew my voice out but that's alright because it, um, it fits. So... I think you should talk a bit more croaky <laughs> So this is an honest reception. <laughs> so um, yeah, the album is now officially done. Uh, I've come in and I've redone the vocals, and um, we're really happy with with the final version. So uh, yeah, thanks to, um, to Daniel and all the guys. Um, now I've just got to finish mixing it, and yeah, I think I think we've got a pretty good album.
reason we did the album the way we did over a week initially in April was to, to get it done quickly and have it finished. Well, here we are on the very last day of mixing. You can hear no news in the background. And I will leave the studio tonight with the final copy that you will hear. Come the end of 2008, going into 2009, we'd done all the tracking, but there were still a few little tweaks to do, and we'd taken mixes home and thought, oh, well, this needs a little bit louder, this guitar could be a bit softer, these drums could be a bit louder here. Um, plus, we had to obviously change things in October with Tim's vocals. We found that um, we didn't actually get the final product of the album mastered and ready to go until January. We're mixing this day forth now, the title track. So we went back into the studio that day with Daniel and uh, we went through and just just did some final tweaks. Uh, we've been listening to the album for a while and we put together a final master, which Daniel handed over. <laughs> Yeah, that's much better, dude. That's the vibe I was looking for. It's always great to uh, lay hands on the final master. It's like this treasured thing. We just remixed uh, Holy Blood. Um, just had to turn up the guitars a little bit. It's a little bit lower, actually. What's that about, Elias' guitar? It's just a little bit lower on this one. I don't know, it's got probably a little bit quieter, I guess. Just maybe the way you played it, so... Can you turn it up a bit? Yeah. There was, even in the very raw, there was always something about this song that was a bit softer than the other ones. You grab it, chuck it in the player and sit back and listen and you, you listen to it and you can hear back all those things and remember all the stuff that was going on at the time. And, uh, it makes it a very special experience hearing it for the first time. So that to me, that to me sounds a lot better. Heaps better. So even though the intention originally had been to record it quickly, the tracking was initially done quickly, and so we got that raw feel, but it wasn't for quite some time that we finally got the master. So we're now mastering. Yeah, can you happy with all the rest of it? Yeah. We're about ready to go. But as we said out at the beginning, we wanted to have something out in early 2009 and we still achieved that, so in the end, it was all good. So we're all mixed now and now we're, uh, now we're doing the final master of the album, so pretty exciting times. We should, should have a final copy after this. Especially when the, the um, post-production sort of stuff um, has gone into it and you, and you don't hear any of that in the studio. So we're mastering with a five band compressor here. It looks like it's called the, the LP64. All the little loose ends and stuff that you didn't uh, see getting finished at the time that are all finished and everything's all worked out and, and it's all so smooth. And so when you hear the, the final uh, master it's just like uh, this is this is what I had in mind this, this is how I thought it was going to be and uh, it's it's come together so well so this is um, this is the moment I've been waiting for a long time we are doing the final burn of the master disc so here we have the final CD. the final handover that is it that's what you hear people thank you <laughs> it's a great relief to get the final master of an album because you've been working so hard and you just finally got it in your hands, a, a CD that represents all that work. Here we are in uh, Dave's car and we're listening to the first, first listen to the final version of um, This Day 4. This is the opening track. No news ain't good news. And we're just heading off to get some dinner. Daylight saving in Perth, so it's, it's actually night time, but you wouldn't know it. So we're just heading off.
head now to Fat Dog. This is definitely, what is it now? It's uh, January 16th. Um, we started in April. You've watched the doco. I hope you enjoyed it. This is the final, final sign out for this album from Daniel Studio. Have any final words, Dave? Oh, thanks for the support, everyone. Hope you enjoy the album. situations we've got in the world at the moment and how how God would see those issues. What I like about this day forth is that um, it's it's a unique little window uh, that, that really captures what um, was, was going on for us. We're so worried about our share portfolio or our retirement or you know what junk food we're going to eat for dinner tonight that we leave God out of the picture. Is it typical um, that great forsaken message comes through? We're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you ain't getting any news about Jesus Christ, that's not good news. The good news is Jesus Christ. Uh, it's definitely a full-on album. 
and uh, I think it sends a message out there to people that uh, you know, kind of on on the edge of faith and thinking, you know, oh, is this really going to work for me? We've got news about everything else happening, um, depending on what spin the media companies want to put on it for us, but very little news about what really matters, which is eternity. I think it's better. I think it's, uh, I love better. It was a lot of fun. Um, I think it was intense. It was really intense. I think the, the songs, which I had, the sort of arrangements and stuff, which I actually had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, the arrangements are very, very good. They're better than uh, Destiny for Ascension. This album is faster, it's heavier, uh, more thrash. Uh, definitely old school thrash. Definitely in the vein of what like, Thornicut, Megadeth. The Wasting Power is good. I also really like uh, No News and uh, Death and Done. I think uh, we did what we had to do on Destiny for Ascension, but um, this one we kind of went at it and just went, you know, if it's not quite good enough, eh, it'll do. It's the sound, so I think it's uh, very, very good. Definitely the sort of thing that I was really wanting to do. As a band member, I would say that it is um, musically pretty much what I always wanted to achieve. This Day Forth is uh, definitely my favourite Grave Forsaken album. Now, when you record your own stuff, it's very hard to listen to it objectively. I listen to Grave Forsaken material and I hear the mistakes, particularly on the EP and the first album. Not so much on Destiny for Ascension because we're better at what we're doing by then. In a heavier direction, a slightly more technical. Um, we've never really been particularly a, a technical band, so really intricate riffs. For the first two albums, um, I wasn't a good enough player to um, quite pull it off. We actually take it a step forward in that kind of area. It will take you And yeah, the end result has really come out what, what we wanted and what we expected. Fortunately, we came out with some really great results in that short time. And, uh, that just reinforces my belief that uh, God is definitely working through all five of it, um, and Daniel as well, to uh, achieve a great result in that time. Definitely the best Grave Forsaken album. This Day Forth is definitely the best Grave Forsaken album. I would definitely say it's the best uh, Grave, Forsaken, Grave Forsaken album yet. This Day Forth is the best Grave Forsaken ever. This Day Forth has got to be the best Grave Forsaken album so far, uh, without a doubt.